Greetings from First Missionary Baptist Church, Cave Springs, Arkansas. My name is Ernest Lostovica. It's another beautiful Lord's Day. We are here today to worship and praise His holy name. He's a wonderful God in our, and a Lord of our lives, so why would we not praise Him for all things? To Today, to worship and to learn more of the God of creation, who who holds our very lives in his hands from moment to moment. So, he alone is almighty, and he alone is worthy of worship, not only this fine day, but every day. We'll be in the study of First Peter beginning today. We'll be on the, the letter of First Peter throughout the fall, and it is a very deep and serious study we will get into it gradually, and we will apply it to ourselves as much as possible because it's not history. It is current relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with our Father in Heaven. So today we begin the study of First Peter, and the theme is very serious. Jesus said it plainly in John 16 and 33, he said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So the tribulation is what we're going to be looking at for the Christian life because we are the enemy of Satan once we become a child of God. And he does his best to destroy our lives. So he will tempt us. He will give us uh, trials and pain and sickness and all these things. But the thing that we want to consider most is the tribulation that comes from simply saying yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. We become Satan's public enemy number one. And the tribulation that Peter is talking about mainly here is that tribulation and persecution that comes because we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells us to take heart just like Jesus did. Be of good cheer because... They treated Jesus with hate and disdain and murdered him. So why should we expect anything more? Because we're not better than the Lord himself. The theme of our study today is this, maintaining hope and holiness through suffering. We don't like to talk about suffering. Uh, we think sometimes that if we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and become a child of God, that everything's going to be fair and rosy for the rest of our lives, but that's not true. We have to know that suffering comes with serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, remember what the mantra of the bodybuilders is? <laughs> no pain, no gain. So when the devil loads us up with tribulation, temptations, and pain, count it all joy because you know that's proof that you are a child of God. Salvation does come at a price. Uh, remember, Jesus died a horrible death, a painful death, to pay for our salvation. So, before we go any further, let's turn it over to the Lord, ask Him for leadership guidance, and to thank Him for our salvation. Lord God, we do thank You for our salvation. We thank You for this day that we can come together as a body of Christ and worship and praise and glorify the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Father, help us through this study today. Help us to pick out those things that are going to touch our hearts. And, Father, just to put everything in perspective, to know that you're still our God, that you love us, and that you're in charge. And nothing in this, nothing in this world can separate us from your love. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we go, we'll be looking at verses 1 and 2 first. First epistle, general of Peter. And it's a salutation to scattered strangers in Asia. Verse 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit 
unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You know, we could spend an hour or more easily on the importance of this salutation alone. But Peter simply is bringing to mind the things that these believers already uh, know. He reminds them that he is an apostle, an authorized messenger, a personal messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. He performed miracles, um, all recorded in the book of Acts, and he actually walked on water. People knew he had the authority of God. Who are these strangers? They're the early believers who left Jerusalem under persecution, under intense persecution, to be strangers in foreign lands, but they took the gospel with them. So, scattered, that word means, yes, even in the simplest meaning of the word, it means to scatter things around, place things separate from themselves, but here the meaning fulfills which showed how seed was sown on a plowed field. It was scattered out over the plowed field in fertile soil and made to propagate a new crop. So God had scattered the seed of the gospel into these areas mentioned, which are all in the area of what is now modern Turkey. And as an aside, we see in Acts 16, verses 6 and 7, that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were going to go to Bithynia. They were headed to this area. And they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. You remember that. Because then Paul had a vision of the man that said, Come unto us in Macedonia. So Paul went to the Greece area, Macedonia, and Peter put the gospel into Asia. So, Peter stayed in the Asian work. Paul went to Macedonia. In verse 2, Peter addresses these believers as the elect, definitely chosen for their purpose. Even today, when God chooses his own, chooses his own, he, know, he, he, he knows in advance. He knows in advance. Peter calls it foreknowledge. The foreknowledge of God the Father. And then it says he sanctified them, set them apart from the world for his purposes, not their own. Many of them might have been thinking, we've got to get out of Jerusalem or die. But God is the one that scattered them for the purpose that they knew the Lord Jesus Christ and they would tell the world. Notice that these purposes are accomplished by obedience to God's call. Sprinkling of the blood of Jesus is a way of saying these elect are mine. It's saying that the believer is anointed to the work of God. Without the shed blood of Christ, of course, there is no hope. Here in this verse we also see the triune God presented, the Trinity of God, God the Father, is mentioned, the God the Holy Spirit, and then God the suffering Son, Jesus Christ. Those three are all involved in the spread of the gospel. Then Peter's benediction to a persecuted church in an area where they were scattered out and much, uh, well, far apart. Grace unto you and peace. Peace be multiplied. That is what we long for more than anything in the world when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have peace of mind and a comfort in the position that he's put us in. Let's move on to verses 3 through 5. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Even 2,000 plus years ago, the world was already ready and prepared for Christ's work and his second coming. Focused 
here in verse 3 on praise to our Heavenly Father who doeth all things well. God is righteous and he does all things in a righteous manner. He has no falsity. He has no doubt. He has everything and all that he has created and planned is a done deal and it's going to be his way. So he is to be praised. That's what this blessed word means here in uh, verse 3. Blessed. In other words, we need to bless God. We need to praise Him and give Him glory for all things. So we do that. Then praise God for coming to us in the body of Jesus Christ. God the Father sent His Son two parts of the Trinity that we are so familiar with. And he did it by his grace and mercy, abundant mercy. And that allows us to be born again. Born again. That's what this begotten unto himself means. We are born again into what? A lively or a living hope. That hope is made real because when Jesus suffered and died, he rose again to life everlasting. So all that believe and all that follow him in obedience and trust then have that hope and the assurance of eternal life. We will be resurrected again even after we physically die. Well, that is still the hope of the believer today. When we're persecuted today for our faith, we endure because we know it's temporary. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 and 2, Paul admonished, for we know that if we, it, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, meaning this body, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal, in the heavens. For in this we groan, in this body now. Yes, we will have tribulation. We will have complaints. We will have all these things. But he said, for in this this body we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our house which is from heaven. No matter how bad it gets, we can rise above it and say there's coming a time when I will be with the Lord in heaven and we will be totally, totally free of all things that this cursed earth is possible of. John 14 and 1 says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then Jesus describes the place he is preparing for God's elect. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Those are all words of encouragement to a persecuted Christian, a follower of Christ who the world hates. Well, verse 4, as we read, says this inheritance is permanent. This salvation, this giving to us of eternal life is permanent. It's eternal. It cannot rot away, corrode away, or be destroyed. Undefiled, pure and holy, safe from the wiles of Satan. Scripture says in James 4 and 7, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, in all circumstances, stand in obedience to God's word. With God's word, you can stand even against the powerful character creature of Satan. That inheritance that we talked about, that salvation will not dim, fade away, or be lost. This world is not the believer's home. The inheritance is reserved in heaven for all that believe. Sometimes we look at the inheritance that might be ours when uh, our uh, inheritors die, they, they would leave us something, and they do most of the time. But sometimes, whatever they had planned for us to have and leave, maybe it's a house, a tornado takes it away, uh, it may burn down, your inheritance is lost. But not at God's inheritance. It is sealed forever in heaven for all that believe. Verse 5 tells us that we are kept by the power of God. Uh, verse, Psalm 91, verses 10 and 11, uh, bring always such comfort to me 
I recommend you read it from time to time, especially when you're down or especially when you're uh, wanting some more comfort and assurance. Verses 10 and 11 say this, There shall no, no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he, who is God, shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. If one, someone asks you, how do you know there are guardian, guardian angels? Just tell them that you read it in the Bible. That is there in Psalm verse 91, verse 10. So does that mean we won't suffer? Of course not. We're in a cursed world, and it is the domain of Satan. And our physical body suffers the curse of sin in many, many ways. But our soul, that's what's important. That's what God looks at. Our spiritual life, our body in Christ is eternal. And that's what Satan cannot touch. Why is the believer persecuted then? Because we follow Christ. John 15 and 18 says this, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Simply put, we are followers of Christ. We are the enemy of Satan and this cursed world. Moving on to verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. How do we respond to that? Peter says we are to rejoice. How can we rejoice when our world around about us is falling apart? Well, when something happens to you and you know that you're a child of God, we are to look up higher than the incident and know that it's not God and it's not your bad luck. It is Satan in his attack. And it becomes proof. It says, if I'm having a hard time, it must be because Satan hates me, and that Jesus Christ loves me. That we truly are the elect of God. It's a proof that when we're persecuted, then we must be children of God. Peter knew what he was to talking about. Uh, he was accused, mocked, spat upon, imprisoned, beaten, scourged, along with the other apostles. Yet what do the scriptures record? In Acts chapter 4, the apostles are threatened by the Jewish council. They said, don't you go around preaching in this name again or we're going to beat you and put you in prison. Well, what was their answer? Chapter 4 of Acts and verse 20 says, we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. So if you are truly trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and serving him, then you will speak of him every chance you get, no matter the consequences, because you're speaking the truth. Well, in chapter 5 of Acts, verse, verses 40 and 41, we see the results of their determination to follow Christ. When they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed, how? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's what we need to learn to do. That in the times of our temptations, the times of our trials, that we can actually rejoice and say, the Lord's going to take care of this, and I trust him. Praise God, we here in Arkansas are not persecuted in that way. But we can't let our guard down. Um, the evil is all around us, and tomorrow we may have to take a stand for Jesus. Already we're being taught that as Christians we need to be more tolerant of the sin around us. How can we say that we're tolerant of sin when the Bible over and over and over tells us that God hates sin? So if we're God's children, we must hate sin also. To be tolerant of sin is a sin. But we love the people, just like Jesus did. Jesus died for the sinner, not just for the ones that he said, well, I'll make these saved and then I'll die for them. No, he died for anybody, whosoever, 
whosoever will may come. So when we look at a sinner round about us, blatantly fighting against the call of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not to stand in their way, but proclaim Jesus, that Jesus loves them also. If we become more and more tolerant of sin, then evil will begin to gain strength more and more, and as believers will begin to suffer for Christ. And true believers will be sought out and made examples of, as were the apostles. Moving on, learn today more and more to rejoice not in the things of the world, there's the key, but rejoice in the knowledge of your sure salvation. We put too much emphasis on God's blessings and not God himself. Moving on to verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If gold is put through the fire seven times at least to get it as near to perfection as possible to remove all impurities, why would not God put us to the fire to purify our faith, to make us as mature and pure and holy as possible before he calls us home to himself? Gold, that most precious metal, it endures all kinds of physical abuse without being destroyed. You can beat it out to one molecule thick into a sheet so fine that you can almost see through it, yet it holds together. You take a diamond, it's a precious jewel, one of the most precious in the world, yet you hit it with a hammer and it's destroyed and valueless. Fire can actually burn a diamond because it's carbon. Yet the more times gold passes through fire and is melted, it becomes more pure and increases in value. That's your faith in the eyes of God. It is to be tried. Peter says, when your faith, which is more precious to God than gold, and gold, by the way, can be lost or stolen, but not your faith. It's yours. It's guaranteed. It's your inheritance. It's your, it's your way to eternal life. When our faith is tried, tested, it becomes stronger and more and more precious to our Lord Jesus Christ. When we appear before Jesus at our death or at his coming, what is the only thing we have that will be acknowledged by him? It's our faith. It's our faith. Our faith and obedience to him and our greatest reward actually is to hear him say to us personally, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Look at it in verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy in spite of trials. The world cannot, well, it does not and it cannot understand. It can't envision God's joy. They have no idea what we're talking about. The world judges all by happiness. Happiness is a state of sensual pleasure. We, of course, also crave it and seek it, yet it is fleeting. It's temporary at best. We can be happy one minute and in the next moment distressed and crying. So God has instilled in us that lively hope, that living hope that is the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, which carries us through the hard times. He promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. That should bring the joy of God in our hearts. Happiness is in itself, in itself cannot do that. It cannot give us joy in the hard times. The joy of God is indescribable and can be attained only by the rebirth, to be the begotten Son of God, to be born again. Yet believing, he said, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. How many times have you personally sang that song? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nehemiah 8 and 10, Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's got to come from within, through the Holy Spirit indwelling you. 
that carries us through the hard times, that carries us through all those times when we think that all is lost, we can joy in the presence of God through our salvation. That verse, Nehemiah 8 and 10, has been the mainstay of most of my life. The let go and let God. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. It's a very important verse of Scripture that we have to trust God. Not just when we want to, not just when we think we need to, but trust Him with our heart in all circumstances. Well, if we revisit verse 8, it says, Whom having not seen, ye love. That's almost a command. You can't see Jesus, but you need to love him. That is the faith for us today. If we are to be tested by persecution for loving Jesus, you may be assured that God is aware of the persecution and will deal with it in his way and in his own time. And when we pass the test, we can receive, well, we actually rejoice to know that our faith is genuine. Just like the apostles, when they were beaten and imprisoned, they sang psalms of praise to God, knowing that they were doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, glorifying God. Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Moving on to verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. It all boils down to your personal walk with Jesus, your salvation that was given to you by the grace of God through faith. It's a gift from God. So be very glad that you're saved. Don't just say, well, I'm saved, but I'm having a sorry time with it in this earth. Yes, you will have. But the salvation, when you say, I am saved, your eyes should brighten, your steps should straighten. You should be able to throw your shoulders back and say, through Christ I can do all things which strengthen me. That brings you joy to know that someone's on your side. Sure, this earthly life leaves a lot to be desired, but we see the end of our struggles in eternity with our first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll say, it was all worth it, Lord. It was all worth it. Look back to verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There it is. There's the joy, knowing that Jesus Christ won the victory for us. Our salvation should be the most joyous of all our thoughts. Like a little child looking forward to Christmas. If gifts bring joy, then we need to enjoy the greatest gift of all. To wrap this up, we see here the beginning of the letters of Peter, the first letter. We need to listen to him. For Jesus Christ chose him personally. And Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. Peter was going to be the stalwart one, the one that knew exactly what he was talking about when he spread the gospel. Peter knew Jesus personally. He wrote of Jesus because he was an eyewitness. Peter remembered his bragging boast that he would defend Christ unto death, yet he denied Christ to save himself at Jesus' arrest. But Jesus forgave him and later asked Peter, Do you really, really love me? And Peter cried out, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus told him, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Here in verse 8, Peter says, Whom you, meaning me and you, and the strangers in this area, whom you, having not seen, you love. That's the one we're supposed to love. No one else. He is our first love. We are to love Jesus above all else. Nothing in the world compares. We can believe Peter. 
He has proven himself before Christ. Now, to sum it all up, we need today to believe that all believers are chosen according to God's foreknowledge. And since God has chosen you today, we need to praise him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord with every breath, with everything that you do. Glorify his name. Praise him for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Praise him for his great mercy. Praise him that the believer is sprinkled by the atoning of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the shedding of blood is a remission of sin. Do you really, really know that God has freed you of the sin in your life? You are now a child of God. And a child of God is sin free in that great expansion of the plan of salvation. For an indestructible inheritance, we have inherited a place in heaven for eternity. And it's there waiting. And it will never be changed. It can't be given to anybody else. It is ours. And we praise him for the trials which make faith stronger. Praise him for the indescribable joy that comes with salvation. Only you can answer this question. Are you really joying in these trials and tests? Well, in our study lessons in First Peter, we hope to maintain our hope and holiness even in suffering. We are to be like Jesus, and no human being ever suffered as he did. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter written by the Apostle Peter. And Lord, as we chew on it, item by item and thought by thought, help us always to not point fingers at anyone else but ourselves. Lord, am I truly trusting you in all things, that my heart is joyful for your gift of salvation. And Lord, no matter what the trial is, that we will rise above it, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.